everyone, welcome to Legal Bites. I'm Alita, I'm a lawyer, and on this channel we explain the law one bite at a time. This is our first visual video since we moved. It's gonna be a while before the rest of our stuff really gets here, so expect all of this stuff behind me to change over time. Anyway, today we're looking at what seems to be a developing strategy of the Trump campaign to contest the election results all the way until a potential contingent election. As always, we're trying to give this as unbiased a discussion as possible, so if you find that we're succeeding in that, go ahead and give this video a like. We'll look at contingent elections, what they are, how they happen, and whether it's possible for the 2020 election to end up there. Heads up, this one's gonna be a bit of a doozy. Coming up on Legal Bites. So despite the fact that election day was a full month ago, and despite the fact that the popular media has projected Joe Biden to win the election, and as I'm sure you already know, the Trump campaign is still fighting for a win in various venues. Many lawsuits have been filed. Many lawsuits have also been either withdrawn or dismissed. Now, it appears that the Trump legal team has started to enter into the realm of legislative quasi-hearings in various battleground states. I say quasi-hearings because it looks so far like they've been held mostly at hotels and state legislatures are pretty much all not in session right now. But anyway, it seems that the Trump campaign's ultimate plan is to encourage the state legislatures through these sort of hearings to fight the certification of the electoral votes within the states, and then if the states actually end up certifying, to press against the legitimacy of that certification. And it seems that the end goal there is probably to create a situation where the election needs to go to a contingent election, which is where the U.S. House of Representatives decides who's president. And the reason the Trump campaign would want a contingent election is because although Democrats hold a majority of the representatives in the House, a contingent election operates by giving each state's delegation one vote, regardless of the number of representatives the state has in the House. And ultimately, Republicans control a majority of the state delegations. So if the election were to go to a contingent election, it's likely that the Republican states would vote for Trump as opposed to Biden, and that's how Trump would be re-elected. But the question of how you get to a contingent election isn't exactly clear, so I wanted to walk through that path to see if maybe we can shine a light on it. So to give this a proper treatment, let's follow a trusty Legal Bites style roadmap. First, we'll start with context. We'll give an overview of the process and some of the history behind it. Then we'll touch on where we are in that process. And finally, we'll get into what would need to happen for Trump to actually succeed on that strategy. If you haven't seen any of our previous videos, I like to give a lot of context to make sure everyone's on the same page. But if you know all of the contextual stuff and you wanna skip ahead, we'll give timestamps in the description below. And really quick before we get into it, this video is sponsored by Andy the Game Maker. Their debut game, Crypto Cartel, a card game, is a ton of fun. It's a resource development game set in the dark, less than legal world of the international black market funded by cryptocurrency. A link to the game is in the description below and if you want free shipping use the promo code legal okay back to the video so for starters we did a video a few weeks ago going over the presidential electoral process in the United States if you're totally unfamiliar with that process I'd encourage you to check that one out first by following the link in the description below otherwise I'll give a slightly different treatment here so as I'm sure you know the United States elects the president and the vice president through the Electoral College states appoint electors usually through a statewide popular vote and those electors elect the president because there are currently 538 total electors a presidential candidate needs 270 electoral votes in order to win in the past there have been several elections where no one has gotten a majority of the votes. When that happens, the vote goes to Congress in a contingent election, which I described earlier. For example, in the election of 1824, no candidate reached the required number for majority of the votes, largely because there were actually four candidates running for office. Those candidates were Andrew Jackson, John Quincy Adams, William H. Crawford, and Henry Clay. What was crazy about that election is that they all actually came from the same political party, which was the Democratic Republican Party. The thing that distinguished them was actually geography northern states, southern states, and western states. Adams was from the north, Crawford was from the south, and Jackson and Clay were both from the west. Because they each took some substantial portion of the electoral votes, Jackson pulled ahead of the rest, but only with a plurality, meaning he took the most votes, but not more than 50% of the votes. As a result, the election went to Congress in a contingent election. The way it ended up in the 1824 election is that basically the race was narrowed down to a vote between Adams and Jackson. And as fate would have it, the deciding vote was cast by none other than presidential candidate Henry Clay. You'd think that two factors would have caused Clay to vote for Jackson. First, they were both from Western states, and that 
that was actually really important in those days. And second, Jackson had the plurality of the electoral votes going into the contingent election. But as it turns out, none of that actually mattered. Clay instead voted for Adams, much to the dismay of everyone outside of the northern states. Adams then served for one term, since Jackson was overwhelmingly elected four years later. Now, fast forward to the election of 1876, where the race was between Republican candidate Rutherford B. Hayes and Democrat candidate Samuel J. Tilden. In that election, there was no issue of a plurality. Rather, there was the nasty situation where multiple states returned multiple sets of electors, called dueling electors. Basically, what happened was Florida, Louisiana, South Carolina, and Oregon all had issues with their electors. In Oregon, the state actually overwhelmingly favored Hayes, but one of the three electors was an elected official, and therefore, by the terms of the Constitution, was unable to serve as an elector. Because of that, the Democrat governor removed the Republican elector and tried replacing him with a Democrat elector. Smooth move, but not exactly kosher. Then, in the other states, elections were apparently marked by outright electoral fraud and threats of violence against Republican voters. As a result, multiple sets of electors ended up getting sent out of Florida, Louisiana, and South Carolina, each set giving a different candidate the win. Without a specific mechanism in place to resolve the disputes of these dueling electors, chaos ensued, and it wasn't until days before Inauguration Day that finally a winner was worked out through a compromise in Congress. You see, at the time, the United States was still in the Reconstruction Era, which was the time after the Civil War when the United States was trying to come back together and unify the North and the South. Anyway, the compromise that ended the election of 1886 also effectively ended the Reconstruction. In the end, Democrats of the South agreed to elect Hayes, the Republican, so long as the remaining American military troops were pulled out of the South and returned home. So ultimately, Congress managed to avert the crisis, but really only by the skin of their teeth. That's why they enacted the Electoral Count Act, or the ECA, in 1887. The ECA gives a whole procedure for how the electoral process is supposed to go, as well as how different disputes concerning dueling electors and other types of challenges to electoral votes are supposed to be resolved. So what can we expect from the ECA in the 2020 election, considering everything that's happened so far? First, let's turn to what's been happening lately. So to begin, while 270 electoral votes are needed to win the election, it's projected that Joe Biden will receive 306. That means that in order for Trump to somehow win, he would need to pull away at least 37 electoral votes from Biden's tally. And looking at the states designated as battleground states, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Georgia have all been called for Biden. And here's a breakdown of the electoral votes in those states. Pennsylvania has 20, Arizona has 11, Wisconsin has 10, Michigan has 16, and Georgia has also 16. Basically what it comes down to is at least the three of those states would need to somehow fall away from Biden. So far, the Pennsylvania state legislature has introduced a resolution disputing the results of the general election. The resolution followed just days after they had their own quasi hearing on the election. Since then, these quasi hearings have been held in Arizona and Michigan, and it looks like one is also planned in Georgia. And the Trump campaign also filed a new lawsuit in Wisconsin this week asking the court to throw out the results of the election and to remand the matter to the state legislature to decide who won. Now it's important to note here that the state legislatures in Pennsylvania, Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Georgia are all controlled by the Republican Party. That said, it's still unclear if anything will actually materialize out of these movements. But assuming that the state legislatures do move forward with challenging the state's certification, there still is a question as to how it could lead to a contingent election. Which leads us to dive a little a bit deeper into the Electoral Count Act. According to the Electoral Count Act, on January 6th at 1 o'clock p.m. on the nose, Congress will have a mandatory joint session to count the electoral votes. The President of the Senate, also known as the Vice President of the United States, will preside over it. Vice President Pence will need to open the electoral vote packets in front of everyone in Congress, and they'll go state by state in alphabetical order, tallying up the electoral votes. And before they move on to the next state, there's an opportunity for members of Congress to object. Objections to electoral votes under the Electoral Count Act are incredibly rare, but they've actually happened a few times. First, in 1969, there was an objection over the vote by an elector in North Carolina on the grounds that the elector was a faithless elector. A faithless elector is an elector that votes against the political party that he or she has pledged to vote for. To limit the risk of faithless electors, a majority of states have actually passed some kind of legislation basically requiring electors to vote with their party. Some states even go so far as to punish the faithless elector, either by removing them and appointing a different elector, or even by fining them, or some combination of the two. And over the summer, the United States Supreme Court made it very clear that this kind of legislation is a-okay. 
In a unanimous decision, the Supreme Court found these kinds of laws to be totally constitutional. It's pretty rare for the Supreme Court to be unanimous on a case that's political in nature, so this should cue you in that the Supreme Court really takes seriously the authority that states have in determining how their electors are to be appointed. Anyway, the second time was on January 6, 2001. In the 2000 election, the electoral count in Florida was held up with recounts and litigation. Ultimately, the Florida electoral votes went to George W. Bush, which was how Bush ended up getting enough electoral votes to win the election. Well, when it came time to actually count the electoral votes, the Congressional Black Caucus actually tried to block Florida's electoral votes from being counted. The problem was there was no senator who was willing to sign off on the objection, so procedurally they couldn't take it to a vote. And that's because in order for an objection to move forward, it has to be submitted in writing and signed off by at least one representative of the House and at least one senator. So in 2001, the objection ended up getting brushed aside. And the last time this came up was in 2005 during President Bush's re-election. This time it was signed by Ohio Representative Stephanie Tubbs Jones and California Senator Barbara Boxer. And the state at issue was Ohio. Publicly, the Democrats who supported the objection said that they weren't trying to overturn the results of the election. And for context, Bush carried the state by more than 118,000 individual votes. Rather, Democrats said that they just wanted to draw attention to what they saw was a need for aggressive election reform in the state because of widespread voter problems. Republicans, of course, saw it another way, saying things like, they're just trying to stall the election and they're trying to promote crazy conspiracy theories about election fraud to distract the American public. Ultimately, that objection was put to a vote and soundly rejected by the House and the Senate, both of which were controlled by the Republican Party, and President Bush was re-elected. In this election, I would almost definitely expect there to be some kind of challenge to multiple states. As it is, Republican Representative Mo Brooks from Alaska has already said publicly that he plans to challenge the electoral votes on January 6th. But how does it work? Well, now we enter into the murky waters of the Electoral Count Act. The wording in this part of the statute is really not written clearly at all, and as a result, legal minds that are more experienced and studied in this area appear to be disagreeing on how things can end up. One thing that is clear, however, is that the Supreme Court has interpreted the ECA to basically say that there's a safe harbor for the deadline for states to submit the electoral vote packages to Congress. Particularly, if the state legislature has a law made before this most recent election day that lays out the process of appointing an elector, that state's electoral vote packet is considered to be conclusive if they follow that process and turn it in at least six days before the meeting of the electors. This year, that means by December 14th. So if they meet the safe harbor requirements, the state is given a lot of weight in this process. But beyond that, what I can tell you is that it basically depends first on how many sets of electoral votes come out of a state by the deadline in December. If there's just one set of electoral votes, the general presumption is that the votes are legitimate. But as has happened in the past, members of Congress can challenge them. When that happens, the Senate and the House separate and go into their chambers to debate and ultimately vote on whether to accept or reject the objection to the electoral votes. In order for that objection to stick, in other words, in order for the electoral votes not to be counted, both the Senate and the House need a majority vote accepting the objection. In other words, if the Senate majority votes to accept the objection, but the House majority votes to reject the objection, then the objection fails and the electoral votes are counted. So taking Pennsylvania as an example, currently there's a resolution in the state legislature that says that they dispute the results of the election because of a laundry list of things that they say went wrong. But at the time of recording this video, there hasn't been any resolution introduced that actually puts forward any competing Republican electors who would elect Trump instead of Biden. Now there is an indication in the resolution that they likely will introduce a second one to do just that, but so far it hasn't happened. So if the Pennsylvania legislature doesn't end up sending their own electors, in order for those electoral votes to be tossed out on January 6th, the objection to them would need a majority of votes both in the Senate and in the House. And currently, the House is controlled by the Democratic Party. So in this scenario, I'd say that there's probably about a 99.9999999999% chance that the House actually rejects the objection and the electoral votes in Pennsylvania end up getting counted. Now, it's an entirely different question when there are multiple sets of electoral votes that are sent to Congress. Now, the idea underpinning the ECA is that when there are multiple sets of electors, it's because there's some kind of disagreement coming from the state as to who was supposed to win and any of those electoral packets can end up being the true voice of the state's populace. Because of that, Congress doesn't automatically give deference to either set of electors. 
In practical terms, that means that there are more ways for Congress to potentially reject the electoral votes. But it's even more complicated, and there's disagreement in the legal field as to how this is supposed to be interpreted because it was written so not clearly. So bear with me. Basically, there are three scenarios that the ECA outlines. First, if there are two sets of electors given, but only one of them can be determined to have met the safe harbor requirements, then that's the one that's to be picked and tallied. The second scenario is where both of the electoral packets claim to have met the safe harbor requirements. In that scenario, neither electoral packet will be counted unless both the Senate and the House agree that the electoral votes should be used. And the third scenario is where none of the packets can claim that they meet the safe harbor requirements. If that happens, then one of those two can be used if both the Senate and the House agree that it complies with the state's laws. Looking at these three scenarios, I think the Trump campaign is probably gunning for the second one. In that situation, it just takes one group, either the House or the Senate, to throw out the electoral votes. In this case, that would most likely be the Republican-controlled Senate. Although, if I may point out, it's still not a sure thing that there would be a Senate majority voting in favor of Trump. A number of senators have publicly stated that they would like to just move forward with the election as it's been called. And there are those that have actively voted against Trump in recent situations. Senator Romney voted to impeach Trump, and Senators Murkowski and Collins voted against confirmation of Trump's recent Supreme Court pick, Justice Amy Coney Barrett. So although it may be the best bet for the Trump campaign, it's still not a home run and it's certainly not a guarantee. <sighs> okay, are you still with me? Good, because it gets even more complicated. On top of that, there's language in the statute saying that if the two houses disagree in respect of the counting of the votes, then the version that's counted is the one that's been certified by the state executive. In other words, if there's disagreement, the governor's version gets counted. In Pennsylvania, the governor is Democrat Tom Wolf, who would side with the electoral votes that would elect Joe Biden. Now there's loads of disagreement among legal commentators as to when it might go to the governor, and that's just because of how this part of the statute was written. Is it just that third scenario, or is it all three? It's really unclear. And anytime you're trying to apply legal words that aren't clear, you have a situation that is ripe for bringing it to the courts for clarification. And this is where I would imagine the United States Supreme Court to come in. For the court, figuring out this whole mess would come down to a matter of how to best interpret the statute and maybe also an interpretation of the Constitution's provisions on the Electoral College. There are multiple approaches that can be taken, so I wouldn't venture to guess how the court might decide in a situation like that without even seeing a controversy actually happen beyond just a hypothetical situation. And whether we even see that actually happen, I have no idea. It seems like a long shot even to get to the point where the Supreme Court is even presented with the situation. But I don't know, what do you guys think about all of this? I understand that this is a bit complex, so I hope I laid it out in a way that was understandable and didn't put you to sleep. Either way, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And before I wrap up, I wanted to give another shout out to the YouTube channel, Hogue Law. Rick Hogue over there hosted me on his channel this week for a discussion about some legal topics that have come up in the world of video games. It was a lot of fun, and if you haven't already, you should definitely check out the video. Link is in the description below. Otherwise, if you enjoyed this, or at least found it informative or useful, please do give the video a like. It helps us with the YouTube algorithm gods and helps us grow our channel. And if you're new here and you want to see more deep dives like this one, consider subscribing to the channel and hitting that notification bell. Although right now we're talking a lot about election law, we do a lot of pop culture analyses too, and if you subscribe, you can see when the next video is uploaded. All right, see you in the next one.